the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail welcomes you. Join with Senior Pastor Dr. Mike Whitson as we present Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. stand with us as we continue to worship when God created the heavens and the earth spoke it all into order and existence he had us on his mind the redemption plan for mankind had already been established and we worship him today
thankful today that Jesus has loved us with an everlasting love. No matter where you are today, He knows your name and He wants you. Whoever calls on His name can be saved. So today we lift our hands and worship Him in awe and reverence that He would love us and give His life for us. All sing. I stand with arms high heart of us, that you would give your life for us, that you would want us. And Father, we worship you in this place today. Father, that you are with us, that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. God, there's a lot of scary things that come our way, trials, and sickness, and just stuff of life that many times are unexpected. But Lord, when we trust you and know you as Savior, Lord, we can face the uncertainty of tomorrow because you're with us. And today, Lord, I pray that if there's someone in this room that is searching for an emptiness in their life, they've never trusted Jesus as their Savior. They don't know what it's like to be a friend of God. I pray that before they leave this place today, that they'll make the greatest decision of all time one of the simplest things they could ever do is just call on Jesus and be saved. So Father, you are our hope, our desire, everything that we could ever want or imagine. It's all summed up in you. So today, Lord, I pray that we would all make much of Jesus. That people would be drawn to him. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for taking care of us. We could never praise and thank you enough. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
on the stormy sea. The disciples woke the master, crying, Lord, save us, please. Then Jesus spoke with authority. He commanded peace be still and instantly every wind and wave obey the master's will. So many times I'm tossed about upon life's stormy sea and though the winds of trouble flow my savior pilots me i know peace be still guides my little boat i'll not fear
those facial expressions of those kids <clears throat> loving Jesus. Speaking of kids, they're a lot different today than they were when I was growing up. A lot quicker. Their response, their comeback is sharper, more intelligent. I heard about an old boy who went to uh, visit one of his friends. His friend was a surgeon and he went to visit his friend Jay and knocked on the door and the surgeon's little five-year-old girl came to the door and uh, so he said to her, said, uh, honey, is your daddy home? And uh, she said, no, he's down at the hospital performing a, an appendectomy. She's five years old. She's performing an appendectomy. Well, he was so caught off by that. He thought, wow, uh, pretty sharp for a um, little five-year-old girl to use such uh, uh, big words that were like that. He, and, and he couldn't get over it. And he said, well, uh, honey, do you, do you know what that means? She said, I sure do said it means $5,000, and that doesn't even include the anesthesiologist. <laughs> we begin a little new series here today uh, through the month of June. I've entitled the series, Questions That Demand Answers. Questions That Demand Answers. And the first question that we're gonna be dealing with this morning is, what is the unpardonable sin? What is that sin that can never be forgiven? What is that sin that uh, concludes with eternal uh, separation from the very presence of God? Well, in order to understand what that sin is, we've got to first of all understand what it's not. So let's dig in for a few minutes and uh, I'd ask you if you would to take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter number 12, Matthew chapter 12 and I want to begin reading in verse number 22. So would you stand with me uh, in honor of the reverence of the reading of the Word of God, Matthew chapter number 12 and uh, beginning in verse number 22. Then was brought unto him, and this is kind of just a backdrop uh, to that question. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. Jesus knew their thoughts, said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, I want to thank you for the power, the strength, the validity of, and the eternality of your word. And Father, as I seek today to just dissect a little portion of it, I pray that your Holy Spirit would 
take these words and as a tool and an instrument of your grace, would you use them to draw men, women, boys, and girls to yourself. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. Please uh, be seated. Now, a lot of times down through the years, there have been a lot to take this passage of scripture, a lot of good men of God, a lot of pastors, a lot of preachers, a lot of evangelists, and have really misquoted, have misinterpreted, have misspoken, and really led people down um, what I would consider a major guilt path that really ought never to have been. So I want to talk a a couple of things. I I want to first of all look at what the unpardonable sin is not and do away with some myths that are out there about the unpardonable sin. And then I want to talk to you for a few minutes about what this sin really is. Now the first thing that I want you to see is that this sin cannot be committed by believers. If you have ever placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, if you have turned away from sin and you now belong to the family of God, take heart because this is a sin that you cannot commit. It is for unbelievers and unbelievers alone. Now there is a companion passage. If you would just put your ribbon there in Matthew 12, we will be coming back to that. And I'd like to ask you to turn over to Mark chapter number three And uh, let's look at a passage there for just a minute. Mark chapter 3, and notice with me verse number 28. Mark chapter 3 and verse 28. Verily, these are the words of Jesus, I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Jesus himself said that if you have accepted Christ, born into the family of God, uh, you can't commit the sin. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, the Bible talks about us being in a personal relationship with Christ And if so, that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Now, how much is all? All. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. That means that there is no sin that you can commit as a believer that is out of the reach of the cleansing of the blood of Jesus. I could go into John chapter 10 and take you there, especially into verse 27. And the Bible says that there's absolutely no sin that a believer can commit that could remove us and snatch us out of the hand of God. Once you are in the hand of God, there is no sin that can take you out of that relationship. Second, not only is it a sin that cannot be committed by a believer, It is not the sin unto death. It's not the sin unto death. The Bible says there is a sin unto death in 1 John chapter 5. If you want to go home and study that, uh, there is a sin. Now, he's not talking here in the context of 1 John 5. He is not talking about spiritual death there. He is talking about physical death there. And uh, also, uh, I will tell you that there are some great examples in the Word of God. Uh, For instance, uh, Ananias and Sapphira uh, in the book of Acts, when they uh, sinned against God, they died as a result. Their soul was saved, but uh, their lives were taken from them. Let me tell you what else it's not. It is not murder or suicide. It's not murder or suicide. Chase over with me to Acts chapter 22, if you will. Acts chapter 22, and keep your Bibles handy because there are a few passages that we're gonna be looking at. In Acts chapter number 22, I want you to see verse four. Paul is saying this. 
Paul says, and I persecuted this way unto the death. Um, binding and delivering unto prisons, both men and women. Now, what has he just said? Paul says, I was a murderer before I came to faith in Christ. I was a murderer. And we know that on the Damascus Road, God gloriously saved that murderer. So we know that it's not murder. Look at chapter 26 in that same uh, book in verse number 10. Notice what else Paul says. Chapter 26, verse 10, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Uh, so Paul was a murderer, but gloriously saved by the grace of God. The blood of Jesus Christ cleansed him. It, it is also, and I know that there are many of you that are in this room today that have been impacted uh, by somebody in your family or a close friend that took their own life. And you have heard it said from many different sources that if a person takes their own life, it is an unforgivable sin. Well, that is not biblical. As a matter of fact, if you look at Samson, Samson took his own life. Uh, and yet we know that he's in the hall of fame of faith as a result of his relationship with God. So suicide is not the unpardonable sin. Uh, even though they do that, they have not repented of it, um, take, taking their own life, no chance of repentance. Well, let's just think for a minute about Highway 74 out here. Isn't that a joy to drive on Highway 74? And uh, it, it's pretty easy out there these days if we're not careful to uh, lose our composure that's putting it mildly. Well, let's suppose somebody cuts you off in traffic and you lose your composure. And in the process of losing your composure, you uh, lost your focus uh, on your driving, slam into the back of one of those uh, construction uh, vehicles that are out there and you were instantly killed. Well, you had no time to repent of the sin of the anger uh, that you had just committed. Well, you understand something with me today. Uh, that's not going to send you to hell. You don't lose your salvation. Repentance is, now, now hang on to this statement. Repentance is not essential to keeping your salvation. It is essential to be saved but it's not essential to keep your salvation. You can't keep your salvation. Only God can keep your salvation. You say, well, why then should I repent? Well, it's to let God know that you know that he knows that you have sinned. Uh, repentance is cranked into the DNA of the believer's everyday practice in this life not to regain some lost spiritual position, but to keep the cognizance of sin ever before us that we are and consistently and constantly are horrified by it, period. Number four, it is not blaspheming or denying Jesus. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, now go back to your ribbon there. And I want you to notice verse 32 for a minute. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world uh, that is uh, to come. Now, you may get ticked off at Jesus. You may even, uh, like Peter, deny the Lord Jesus and yet you can still be forgiven. You can still be saved. You ask the question, why in the world then did Jesus pick the third person of the Godhead, the Trinity, that an offense against him would bring about the unpardonable sin? Well, hang on. We're going to get there. 
Uh, Be patient for just a few more minutes. Paul, writing his letter to Timothy in that first epistle, in the first chapter, in uh, that 12th verse, Paul says to Timothy, in the former days of my life, before I received Christ as my Savior, I blasphemed the name of Jesus. But we all know that Paul came to Christ and was saved. So it's not blaspheming against Jesus. Five, understand that the unpardonable sin is not, and you will hear many that will say that it is, but hear this, it is not quenching or grieving the Holy Spirit. Those are entirely different scenarios, if you will. First Thessalonians chapter five and verse 19, the Bible says don't put out the fire of the spirit, but at the same token, it says absolutely nothing about if you do put the fire of the Holy Spirit out that you have committed the unpardonable sin. There's a great command in Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus in chapter number four in verse 30 that he says, don't grieve the spirit with whom you have been sealed until the day of redemption. And he also says in that first chapter in verse 13 that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise when we were converted. The Holy Spirit of God zapped us and committed to us and marked us in ownership and also in protection. And you say, well, how long? Well, the Bible says until the day of redemption. You say, well, well, wait a minute now. My redemption came, I thought, when I got saved. Well, yes, everything but your body got redeemed at your salvation experience. Your body is still yet to be redeemed. Now, if you don't believe that, go look in the mirror. Can I get an amen from somebody? Now, it's, when we get to heaven and our bodies are going to be redeemed, that's going to be a glorious time. You're going to see me, listen, you're going to see me walk down the street and your mouth's going to fly wide open. Your eyes are going to get big. And you're going to say, wow, is he ever a head turner? (laughs) Hmm. Why is that? Well, you're going to be as well. You're going to be head turners because our body's going to be redeemed. Now, we can't see it now, but by faith, we can see it afar. All right. So what is it then? If it's not all of those things, what is it? Well, let me just answer it this way. It is permanently rejecting God's means of salvation. Permanently rejecting God's means of salvation or the vehicle of God's salvation that comes to us, casting doubt an aspersion of the grace that God himself has committed to us through the person of the Holy Spirit. How does that happen? How do you do that? How do you permanently reject the Holy Spirit? Well, let's look at three things and then we'll close. First of all, it's by call, and I didn't see this. I just didn't see this. I've read this numerous times, but I I never equated it uh, to a process of committing the unpardonable sin until my studies. I've only preached on this subject one time in the last 35 years here. And so when, when 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 I worked this message and began to deal with this passage, here's what I saw. How do you commit the unpardonable sin? You begin by calling good evil and evil good. Watch what happened. Again, back in that mark, I want you to hold your thumb over there at mark. I I want you to look at chapter three again and notice with me verse 30. Mark 3, 30. Because they said he hath an unclean spirit calling that which was good, 
evil and evil good. Now, Jesus here is calling attention to the context uh, of his encounter with these Pharisees, these religious leaders. They were the very people, listen to this, they were the very people who saw God's means of salvation, who saw the Son of God, and they called that which was good evil, and they did that by consistently in their life rejecting the Holy Spirit. Now, when you get home, you want a little study time, go over and read the life of Stephen. Stephen was the first martyr of the church. Do you remember Stephen? Shake your head like that. Let me know what you know about him. Now, now Stephen died way too young. My opinion, he died prematurely. Do you know why? Because he didn't have any tact about him. And, and, and the reason I know that is he looked at the very people that Jesus is referring to and talking to in Matthew 12, and he looked at those very people and he, he declared, he says, you stiff-necked people, you always resist the Holy Spirit. How can you call good evil? How does that happen? Your thinking gets depraved. and You keep on rejecting and rejecting and rejecting God's means of truth. Number two, it is a refusal to allow the Holy Spirit to convey God's truth to them. A refusal to allow the Holy Spirit to convey God's truth to them. What does that mean? Go over with me to the Gospel of John and the 14th chapter. John chapter 14. And I want you to see verse 25. John chapter 14, verse 25. Watch this with me. Verse 25 and 26. Jesus said, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Jesus said, uh, to his followers, he says to you and me, I'm not going to write a bunch of books and leave them for you to be able to devour and digest and read and memorize. I, I'm not going to give you some kind of digital means uh, by which you are to receive these things. I am going to send you a person. Not an it, by the way. The Holy Ghost is not an it. Amen. He says, I'm going to send you a person, the Holy Spirit, the exclusive deliverer, if you will, to the truth. Um, and if you reject him, then you will never have the truth because he is the exclusive deliverer of the truth. Look, look at chapter 16 and verse 7. This is powerful, seven and eight. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter, the Holy Spirit will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will convict the world of sin. He will convict the world of righteousness. And he will convict the world of judgment. Now, let's break that down a minute. The Holy Spirit of God is going to come. He is God's exclusive deliverer of the truth. He's given a threefold mission. One, he says, he's coming to convict the world of sin. That which is a personal affront to God and is the basic problem of every one of us in this room and all of humankind. Now, here's the deal. I've learned I can't convict anybody of sin. 
The government can't convict anybody of sin. Education can't convict anybody of sin. I used to think that I could. I did. I, I thought I could do that. And, and God forgive me, I tried. I'd get into somebody's house and I'd put them in a headlock. You're gonna die and go to hell if you don't come to Jesus. If you don't, you don't repent of your sins, you're gonna go to hell. I'm not, a, I haven't done anything. Yes, you have. You're a sorry, low down, good for nothing. I wanted to convict him. I'd, I'd stay there and I'd, I'd talk and, and, and I'd show them and, and I'd debate with them and, and try to convict them of sin. I've learned better. I, I'm not the Holy Spirit of God. And, 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 and the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to convict of sin. I, uh, I'll never forget the first time that I learned that that was not my job. Um, I, 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 was, I was pastoring and going to school at the same time and I showed up at seminary on Monday after a dry Sunday. I, nobody got saved. Nobody, it wasn't even a holy grunt all day long. And I, I'm thinking to myself, somebody else needs to do this. I, I'm just no good at this. And evidently there's something about me that's just not usable. And, 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 I, got, and I was just really feeling low and, and, and down. I go to that seminary class and my professor who now lives in Charlotte, he communicated, he said, now boys, there's about 50 of us in the room now, boys. It's Monday. And he said, understand it's not your job to convict anybody of sin. That's the Holy Spirit's job. And I'm telling you, the load that lifted off my shoulders that day was unbelievable. So it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict of sin. Now notice what else he says. It, not, not only to convict of sin, but he says to convict the world of righteousness. Now what does that mean? I, I, I used to try to do that too. Uh, I thought that you had to be righteous to be saved. And so I set out to be righteous. I can do this. No, I can't. I can do this. No, I can't. I can do it. No, I can't. And I understood that it's not my responsibility in that area. That once again is God's responsibility. Only the Holy Spirit of God can convict a person that they are bankrupt as a sinner that this righteousness, this self-righteousness can only be remedied by his righteousness imputed to us. And if you cut the delivery boy off that God has sent to do that work, then you will never be able to trust in any other thing in order to get to heaven when you die. Then he says, convict the world of judgment. Now, in October, we're gonna have a drama around here that we've had, oh, I don't know, dozens of times over the last number of years called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. And in part of that drama, uh, there is a judgment scene called the Great White Throne Judgment. And, and, and place will be packed full. And may I say to you, as powerful as that drama is, that drama cannot convict anybody of the judgment that is to come. Only the Holy Spirit of God can do that. So he's to convict the world of sin. He's to convict the world of righteousness. He is to convict the world of the judgment that is to come. And once you reject the delivery of the grace of God through the person of the Holy Spirit of God, then there's no chance. You have removed yourself from the conditions of pardon. Uh, now, understand that is the third means that we're going to talk about here of leading up to the commitment of the unpardonable sin. Removing oneself 
from the conditions of pardon. Now, when a person does that, they have removed all possibility of salvation. The Gospel of John, chapter number 6 and verse number 44, you all know that passage, I'm sure. And here's what it says. Listening? Everybody listen. He says, unless the Spirit of God draws us to God, we cannot be saved. May I say to you, you didn't just wake up one morning and decide that morning that, you know what I'm going to do? Uh, I'm going to quit this life of sin. I, I'm going to start living right. I'm going to be saved today. Uh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to live for God the rest of my life. You didn't just wake up and decide to do that. Nobody ever wakes up and decides just to do that. It is the drawing, it is the wooing of the Spirit of God that leads uh, to salvation. And when you remove yourself from that, then you removed yourself from the conditions of pardon because the Word of God says in Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 3, he says, my spirit will not always strive with man. Isaiah chapter 55. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Hmm. How many of you... Um, have cable television or satellite television. Let me, let me see your hands. Hold them up. Yeah, 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 about everybody in the building. So if I mention the station QVC, most of you are going to know what I'm talking about, aren't you? Mm -hmm. You ever sit there and you know, they come out and they put on these demonstrations of a product and enticing you to buy one of them. And boy, they, they do some wonderful things with that stuff. And, and you, you get enamored. Wow, I want one of them. Hmm? Sure. Yeah, have you noticed, though, it doesn't work as good at your house as it did on that television screen? <laughs> and, and here's what they'll say to you. Here's what they'll say to you. You, you better call now because we have a limited supply. We only have six more left. We have 12 more left. We have 25 of these left. We have a limited number, so if you're going to get one, you better get, I want one! Fact of the matter is, they got four transfer trucks full in the warehouse. But now here's the deal. When God says, that the opportunities for salvation are limited. He means it. He means it. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. When we shut off God's exclusive franchise that brings conviction that brings the truth of the cross, that there can be no remorse. And if there's no remorse, there can be no repentance. And if there is no repentance, there can be no forgiveness. And if there's no forgiveness, there can be no salvation. And we are then guilty of that eternal sin. I come across this all of the time. A little prose that goes, there is a time we know not when, a place we know not where, which marks the destiny of men to glory or despair. There is a line by us unseen which crosses every path, which marks the boundary between God's mercy and his wrath. Now, what, what, is that, what does that mean? It, it's kind of like an aeronautical term. It's an aviation kind of picture, if you will. There, there's a phrase in aeronautics called the point 
of no return. When a plane takes off from point A and it's going to fly to point B, there comes a time in the process of that flight that that airplane crosses a line that is called the point of no return. And it simply means that there's not enough fuel on board that plane to get back to the place that it started from. And the same thing has to do with the response to God and the Holy Spirit in our life. You may be able to say no once. You may be able to say no twice. You may be able to say no three times. You may be able to say no 300 times, but there will come a day that you will say no, that you will never be able to ever say yes. I don't know how many, uh, I've been preaching since 1973. I, I don't know how many people only heaven is going to reveal. I, I watch it. I, I watched it this morning in the eight o'clock service. But I've watched people on a regular basis. Don't know Christ. Never given their heart and life to Jesus. Don't have a personal relationship with him. And I watch them as they come into the house of God and they'll listen to the great music and and they'll pay attention to the preaching and the Holy Spirit begins to work incredibly in their life. And then during the invitation, down through the years, only heaven's going to reveal how many. I've watched people during that invitation grab hold of the seat in front of them and hold on so tight that their knuckles would just turn white and their bodies would tremble and maybe even some perspiration would fall off of their face and they would be struggling with that wooing of the Spirit of God. And they would want to say, yeah, I need to go do that. I, I need to give my life to Jesus. And, 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 and then that internal struggle, well, there'll be a better time. I'll wait till a different day. I, and all kinds of excuses go through their mind. And I, I watch them the next Sunday and they're holding on and they want to let go, but they don't. And then I watch them another Sunday and they're letting go. And after a little while, I'm watching their knuckles are not nearly as white as they once were. And then I'm watching them as they get so relaxed, they, they don't even hold on to the back of the seat anymore. And then before long, it's kind of a hit and miss in their attendance. And before long, they're not coming at all. Down through the years, I'll get that call. Pastor, I uh, hate to tell you the news, but so-and-so died last night. And I'll know. I don't know how often it's been. I don't even like to think about it. There's a line, this is a, an old hymn that was sung in a lot of the moody revivals during an invitation. There's a line that is drawn by rejecting our Lord when the call of his spirit is lost. And you hurry along with the pleasure mad throng, have you counted? Have you counted the cost? You may barter your hope of eternity's morn for a moment of joy at the most, for the glitter of sin and the things it'll win. Have you counted? Have you counted the cost? While the door of his mercy is open to you, ere the depth of his love you exhaust, won't you come and be healed? Won't you whisper, I yield? I have counted, I have counted the cost. Have you counted the cost if your soul should be lost? Though you gain the whole world for your own, even now it may be that the line you have crossed, have you counted? Have you counted the cost? 
every Saturday I kind of do my best to just get my heart warmed so that I can be my best on Sundays for the Lord and just want to get as close to him on Saturdays as I can. And I was sitting in my study, just in the house was quiet. And sitting there behind my desk and I was thinking about the service today and thinking about the time leading up to the invitation. I was thinking that today God may be sending somebody here to be drawn one more time. Maybe for your first time. And then I thought that God may also be sending some people here this morning that will be drawn for their last time. And go past the line of ever being drawn again. Would you pray with me? And Father, I don't believe any of us in this room are here accidentally today. I, I believe, God, that you have awakened us this morning. And, God, you put it in our hearts that we're to be here to hear your word today. God, I, I pray for those that are here this morning that have never placed their faith and their trust in you have never turned away from sin, don't have the assurance that when they die, they're going to go to heaven. Know in their heart of hearts that they don't have a personal relationship with you. And God, today you have, by your Holy Spirit, you have been drawing them all morning. Drawing them to surrender their life drawing them to be saved. I pray that not one, not one person that you're drawing today would reject and say no and be in danger of crossing that line forever. May everyone here say yes. Come to the full knowledge of who you are forgiveness of their sins. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.